Amen. As I said, this is a part three today, John chapter 15, a text that Jesus spoke to his disciples the last night he was with them. This is a very serious text, a very intimate text, and I hope that all of us here in this room this morning, we are receiving it as disciples as well. Hallelujah. So just before we go to the text, I want to show you something that we have on YouTube also that, that uh, I think is interesting for, for all of us to, to know that. Uh, when you come at the end of our messages now, you will see a, a new tool that will allow you easily to subscribe. You can click on it. So, uh, I know, the 20 you know last I, second of our videos to. now will have these, natural these self tools. That needs so much, the pruning so techniques I don't need to preach this one, I can listen to and that. And he knows if which you techniques to use this one here, for which see, quirks and which flaws that we have so that you will get more fruit the last as we of the week begin before. 2017 so these are new tools that we will have on the, the YouTube morning, would you close uh, your every eyes week and like that end up so we encourage you to use these tools subscribe uh, share with other people and uh, same thing for Pastor Jennifer's message so we don't need to really show it you saw it's the same thing at the end of our message it will be like that so continue to share it people from all over the world they watch the sermons so these are tools to help them sign up subscribe yourself to the channel you will be notified when the new uh, sermon comes or any other videos of music or uh, performance that we we have so you can you can follow uh, with with these tools that are available even when you watch on the uh, facebook do the same thing you can like it if you subscribe you can like you can show i like the message you can write comments it's always encouraging to do that amen Praise the Lord. So as we are in the third part of the message, let's go to our message and just do a review. The next, the next uh, picture. This is our title. Remember, we, we were showing like last, last time using many, many pictures because Jesus used a sermon and pictures, a metaphor to illustrate from nature a very important principle about the, the way we should be living our, our relationship to him. So here we, we see a, a, a vineyard. This is a typical vineyard uh, before fruitfulness, like in the winter after it has been pruned. And this is you. This is your life. Amen? Do you like to see yourself like that? You like to see abundance of fruit and greens and everything, but rea the reality, this is, this is more what we resemble. And this is because God is working in your life and in my life. Go to the next one. Uh, just as way of review, uh, these are like the different process, you know, the work of the uh, uh, vine dresser or the husbandman, and they are pruning us, and then the goal is that we will be bearing much, much fruit, and the Father will be glorified. We are proving that we are true disciples when we uh, produce more truth, uh, more fruit. Next, next one. We spend more time on the last message to talk about pruning, what it is. It's actually a very important. The vine dresser looks for anything that is useless, will chop it off, it will be burned, and is clearing away even, even branches that could be bearing fruit so that the sum of the branch that will bear more fruit will, will have a, a, better, a better production. And it is to maximize the nutrients, the fruitfulness, Pruning, the pruning techniques is future-oriented. God looks at our life and, and its future and the old term of our Christian walk with Him. And He sees the potential that we have and He wants to chop whatever is useless in your life, whatever is of the flesh, whatever is of yourself, because only the, the, the sap of the living Jesus Christ will bear spiritual fruit in our, in our lives. And pruning experience reduce our dependence upon our own, our own flesh. So we discussed that uh, in the last time. And the, the vine dresser in the springtime uh, walks in this vine and he's looking for proof. Proof of fruitfulness. Signs. Potential of fruitfulness. And when he sees it, he will, he will take care of everything. He will prune whatever is around so that this we will be bearing much, much fruit. So we spent quite a lot of time last time. That was the main part of, of the message. So this morning I want to 
bring you a, a short video that I put together yesterday, edited it. It talks about uh, two seasons of pruning. One is winter pruning and one is a spring pruning and it, they, it's being explained to us why it is necessary and how it's being done. Uh, this time of year, we're busy pruning the vineyard. The pruning really is the most important part of the winemaking process. And so what we're doing now is grapes only come off of second year wood, we call it. So we have to pr prune back last year's wood so we can get new grapes on this right now. All right, so here's the spur. And so from last year, this is last year's wood, or the year before last. And then where we pruned, we wound up getting one cane coming off of here, which was originally was a bud, and then this one here. So this year, we want to go down to one cane. We prune there, and there's one bud at the base and one bud here, and we prune here. Then this bud will turn out to be a brand new cane for this year, and one will come off here at the base and come on up, and each cane will produce two clusters of grapes. Springtime is the perfect time to be pruning your grapes, especially this year when the temperatures dropped into the minus 20s. A lot of damage was done to the plants without us even knowing it. And now this time of year with the new growth, we can see what's alive and what's not. And runs along the wire, it is known as the cordon. From the cordon is last year's growth known as spurs. From those spurs, the growth this year is called a shoot from which this year's fruit will come. And today our goal is to maximize fruit production. What we need to do at this point is reduce the size of the plant itself. And we'll do that by coming in and cutting the canes down to two or three live buds. And then measure about a fist width, four to six inches between the spurs and remove anything in between. We also want to remove any growth that's pointing down that has been damaged by insects or damaged by the winter weather, wind, or hail. A properly pruned grape has 80 to 90 percent of its growth removed. As you can see from this plant, there's not very much left from the original plant. With a good growing season, you can expect to have a bountiful harvest from these plants. Amen. That's our life. That's the work of our vine dresser in our lives. 80% of 90% of the growth is removed in the vine. That's how much work is necessary. So we can see, looking at this metaphor, that there's a lot of flesh. There's a lot of self in, in, in our life, in our everyday uh, doing, in our, in our doing things. You know, we're all intelligent people. God gave us a body to do a lot of things. We can do everything manually with our body. But when it comes to fruit in the kingdom of God, spiritual fruitfulness, we cannot produce that. But all of us, after we become Christians for, for a number of years, we all can um, do it mechanically. Pastor can preach without any anointing, without any uh, hearing from God. We can, we, because we become professional enough, we just open the text, we just take notes, and then we just preach. We can be very eloquent. Any Christian can come to church, know the songs, do things, shake hands, go for lunch after church without having anything of God in, in our life, all this. So that pruning is a very important work of the vine dresser because he cares so much, and it's just a proof of love and interest in our life. He will remove the flesh, as you have, you have seen. Go, go back Back to the previous uh, uh, slides here. You will see here, pruning experience reduces our dependence upon the flesh. Pruning is for our spiritual welfare. Pruning is future oriented. It removes, it does something so that the, the, the life of Jesus can flow better. And th that brings us to our text for today. Abide, abide in me and I in you. Uh, the next slide. Abide in me and I will abide in you, just as the branch cannot produce fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches, the one who abides in me while I abide in him produces much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing.
Unless a person abides in me, he is thrown away like a pruned branch and dries up. People gather such branches, throw it in the fire, and they are burned up. Eleven times in these few verses, the word abide, or depending on your Bible version, remain or, or be united, uh, is there. Abide eleven times. That's the key word for today. Last week, we looked at the key words, fruit, no fruit, fruit, more fruit. This week, we're looking at abide. That's our, that's our key word for today. And the key word, if you look at the next slide, you will see where it comes from in the term that is being used. The Greek word that means to stay to remain, to continue. And it brings us to uh, three different uh, implications. Uh, connection, dependence, and continuance. The connections is the union with Jesus Christ. And it is mutual. I, uh, abide in me, I and you. You and me, me and you. So that's a mutual unity. Jesus promised to you. And this is he is also expressing his desire for unity with you. He invites you. You abide in me. This is the way that I want you. That's the only way that you have to live your Christian life. If you don't do it, then you cannot have a Christian life. Abide in me so that I can abide in you. So that is the, the message. So that's really important. No of this connection, no fruit, no life. Dependence. We have seen the last time that the branch depends totally about the vine. It receives everything from the vine. The sap that flows into the branch supplies water, mineral, nutrients that makes it grow. And we Christian, it says it in, this, uh, in the same way. Also, you are in the, same, in the same way. Apart from you, you cannot do nothing. Neither can you. So it is about us and it is about our dependence. Of, of Jesus Christ. We believers depend completely of this spiritual grace that falls, flows from Jesus Christ into our life. Without that, we have nothing. We have, don't have the, the life. So this is our apart. Uh, it shows our dependence, our need for dependence. Apart from him, we can do nothing. So that's the message here. And the continuance, which is the main point I would say of this, of this text here. Look at the context sometimes to understand better what Jesus is really telling us, its message. It's the last night he's with his apostles. He's leaving them. And he is leaving them with a mission. For three years he trained them. He spoke the words of the Lord to them. He's leaving. Are they going to continue? How are they going to fulfill their mission? And later on in this chapter, you will see the world hates you. As they have hated me, they will hate you. So you have the flesh, you have the devil, you have the oppositions, you have all the troubles of life. You will have trouble in your life, but take courage. I have overcome the world. So how can Christian make it all the way? So Jesus is telling them what he's telling to us. Just hold on. Bambalila. Hold on to Jesus, the, uh, the song says. Hold on to Jesus. Just continue. Just persevere. Be faithful. That's the, the, what the, the word remain in Jesus. I, I, I prefer the word remain because it, it carries the, the continuation, the, the staying there, staying put with Jesus. Remain in me and I will remain in you. Continue to live. Continue to be connected to me. Jesus used it in John chapter 8. He says, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. You will know the truth. You know this, this verse. If you persevere in my word, if you remain faithful to my word, and you will see that in this message today, abide and believe is interconnected. You cannot abide without believing. But abide in the word of God is also essential. The word of God is is there in this text everywhere. Abide. If you abide, if you persevere in my word, if you keep on attaching yourself, living according to my word, continue to obey my word, pay attention to my word, bring my word into your life every day. If you, if you do that, 
if you continue faithfully in my word. So how can you be a Christian if you don't do that? The basic rule of Christianity rests on the word of God, your relationship to the word of God. If you don't have that, how can you grow in faith? How can you be corrected? How can you be stirred up by the promises of God? You can't. Is the basic things. Remain in me if you abide in my word. So abiding is also an all or nothing deal. It's not optional. It's not negotiable. And it's not partial. You just only abide a little. Or abide sometimes. It, it's, it's non-existent. It doesn't make sense. Abide is continual. It's the relationship of faithfulness, of perseverance. It, this is what Jesus is talking about here. There's only one way to live a Christian life, according to this text. I don't know if you are like me. I mentioned it before, but every time I read John 15, it does something. It stirs me up. It makes me question myself, my relationship to Jesus every single time. It doesn't matter. You can read it 50 times, 100 times, or hundreds of times. When you get to these words, if you remain in me, my word remain in you. Okay, Lord, okay, you're talking to me now. Where am I about this text? It's an all or nothing deal. And, and abiding is not a prayer. Oh, today I abide. I have prayed up. Or today I have read my Bible. It's not a today things. It's a everyday things. It's a continual uh, walk with the Lord, a state. And to help us to grasp a little bit more the idea of, uh, of uh, abiding, the next slide, we, I, I'm talking about graft. A, a graft. Think of abiding like a branch being grafted. Wh what's the, the process of life? Wh what's happening to this little shoot? These little shoots that are being attached to this branch and there's an incision between uh, the, the, the trunk and the bark and everything and there's nutrition that are different techniques. Or you see this little shoot here that has an incision and you see already life is beginning and you see one here that is mature. So you, you see a, a process here. You see something that is taking place. And uh, they are like a, a twofold process. One, we call it a structural union. It's the wood becoming the wood of the other. It's the likeness, the nature, the physical nature of, of the graft. This little one will take the nature of this one. It will look alike. If you look at this one and this one, it has become now the same uh, structural uh, union. It has become the same in the likeness. The second one is a, is a, a, a living union, a union of, of life. There are some, we, we don't see it, but I was looking at some pictures of, of graft. There are, and within these little shoots and the branch, some little, uh, Conduit, like some little, you know, uh, it's like a, a, a road or a something where water can can flow through. It's it's so so there are some uh, maybe like the the vein of your body or the arteries of your body, and then there is life coming, and then it produces flowers, it produces you know life in this one. So there's life coming of that, and so that gives us a, a more. Uh, picture, a better picture of what uh, abiding or remaining in Jesus is by looking at how a graph becomes alive and takes the nature of the, the, the one that produces the, the sap in the life in it. So when Jesus says abide in me or remain in me, he is pointing to something similar to that. A character is formed. You remain in Jesus. You are faithful to his word. You are approaching him every day. You live your life conscious of, of this union that you have with him. You know, if you look at, the, uh, for example, the letter of uh, Paul to Ephesians, the word in Christ, in him, is repeated. That's the key word of that uh, lesson. We have access to all the promises of God. We have a new citizenship before we were out. Now we are in. The word in is a big word in the New Testament. God in us. The Holy Spirit is in us. When you and I, we were born again, 
already there is an abiding. The Holy Spirit abides in us. We are born again. The Spirit lives in us. Jesus says, the Comforter will come. He will be with you. He will be in you. And He will stay with you. So there's this abiding. But here we're talking about the continuance of this abiding. The, the, the progressions that will lead to the life that God has. When you are saved, you come from whatever background, worldly viewpoints and old natures and traditions and corruptions and understanding. Now you have the new seed, the seed of the Father in you. This potential is starting in us. Now we're talking about Jesus talking about his disciples. They are going to continue the work that he began on earth without him being physically there. They have become mature. They are going to continue the work. They are going to perform miracles. They are going to share the word of God. They are going to be the representative of Jesus Christ on earth while he is in heaven. He's going to continue to pray for them, intercede for them. The Holy Spirit is going to help them and guide them. So, so now we're talking at a level, level, a different level. When you are born again, the potential is there. The abiding is there. Now we're talking about producing, walking, growing, and, and the continuing the work of God. What Jesus is telling us, a character is formed. The heart is being transformed. And the fuller experience of Christ can take. I and you. You abide in me. The character is transformed. I can now abide in you. I can now uh, continue to operate in you. Abide in me, prepare me for the work that he is going to do when he abides in me, when he will continue. You continue with me. I will continue with you. What I started in you, I will complete it. I will make it grow. I will be with you. All I ask, all that is necessary for you is abide, dwell, continue, hold on, just persevere, and I will do it. You know, many believers, they pray. They have a religious life. They have an appearance and, and some experience of life, but something's missing. It seems that they are making no progress. It seems that there is not really like a life, an abundant life in them. What's the problem? Maybe the problem is that the I and you cannot come because the abide in me is not being maintained. If there is no abide in me, how can the I and you will fully be operative and operation? Maybe that's the problem. Before the spirit can fill, there must be a heart prepared uh, for that. Next slide. We're going at another key word that is really important. It's the word accept and unless which is very important. The Lord is giving, you know what is really wonderful with the Lord? He's, he's the greatest preacher. He is the, the one, he knows exactly what he wants to tell us and he tells us perfectly. The Lord doesn't have an, a, a, a hidden agenda. Or we will just show you the, the honey side of Christian life. He will give you the both sides. And he will contrast it and make it so clear that there is no misunderstanding possible. So he starts and saying, hey, abide in me. You will bear much, much fruit. Abide in me. But I want you to pay attention to the word accept or unless over there, which makes the condition essential. Abide in me and I will abide in you just as the branch cannot produce fruit by itself unless or except it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless or except you abide in me. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, the King James says, um, uh, if a man abide not in me. If a man abide not in me. So there's a, hey, abide in me, the call, the invitation, the privilege, the way to live that is contrasted with if the man Abide not in me. You see the, the contrast there. He is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. Wow. That's quite a picture. 
And many theologians that I have looked about this text, they all want to tell us one thing, that you cannot lose your salvation, that this text is not about losing, that a Christian cannot lose his salvation. That's almost all of them are making a strong point. But I look at this text and I question this because that's not what Jesus seems to see here very clearly. Because there's a branch that was attached and now this branch is not abiding. It's not remaining and that's the point of what he's saying. He's leaving his apostles to themselves. But they can r remain in him. They can stay attached to him even though he's in heaven. There's a spiritual connection that continues even if Jesus Christ is not physically possible with you, uh, physically present with you right here. And that's true for you, that's true for the apostle. But if you want that connection, you must remain. If you don't remain, how can the Lord communicate? How can the, the Lord strengthen, renew, correct? Uh, lead you if there is not this remaining, this continual. If you disconnect, what happens if you disconnect? You cut the wire, the phone wire, the internet cable. You disconnect it, what happened? No internet. You like it? No internet. It's really terrible today. It's like Wi-Fi is almost as important as water and food and bread. There's no Wi-Fi, there's no life no life. So here if you don't have this abiding you know, and this word here says no man can cut off a branch that was never united. Okay, here it says he will cut off the branch he is cast out cast away or thrown away cut off and that branch will wither and the branch will be thrown away. Where was that branch when it was cut off? Was it connected or not connected? It was connected. So what's the problem here? There was a branch connected there. That means that this branch was meant to be with Jesus, to bear fruit by Jesus' grace. But that branch is now being cut off. So don't tell me that it, it is not about, it's impossible to lose your salvation. But anyway, I think that we should not make theological point based on a metaphor, okay? So let's not do it. Let's say that Jesus is warning us. And I believe that whether it is about salvation or not, or fruitfulness, the message still is a valid message and a very serious warning that there is something that can go wrong with your life and my life with Jesus Christ. Whether we lose our salvation or not, leave it aside. We are called to bear fruit. We are called to, to dwell, abide, live by, continue to walk with Jesus. But here it says, if a man abide not, so that means there is a possibility of not abiding. And that is your decisions and my decisions, my negligence. What are some of the terrible things that happen to someone who abide not? He is cast away or thrown away. Was it God's ori original intention? No. The original intention is abide, bear more fruit, prove you are disciples, glorify the Father. When you pray, any prayer you will ask will be answered. You will have more, more joy in your life. You will know the love of God. Abide in my love. As I, my Father loved me, I love you. That's the message. That's a positive message. It's a wonderful message. It's all a privilege. It's a call. Why a warning then? You, can, you are intelligent enough to understand that this is an encouragement to us to, to, to live by Jesus and to bear fruit. It's a wonderful thing. We are sinful human beings. And God, Jesus Christ, took our, our sins upon himself. His blood washed away our sin so that we have the privilege, the call, abide in me, come to me, come near to me, live with me, live by me. That's... Uh, 
total privilege of given to human being. There's not greater privilege than that. And as I said in the last message, as soon as the vine dresser sees the potential of fruit into your life, he, in his mind, immediately says, Ah, I see the potential of fruit. I will produce more fruit with that person, which is a message of encouragement. It's a message about the future. It's a message of everything that God can do in you. There's no limit about your age. There's no limit about your nationality. There's no limit about your size. There's no limit about anything. You abide. Let the vine dresser do his work and you will be bearing fruit and the Father will be glorified. That's the, one of the most beautiful, uh, you know, to, to uh, heart-searching, mind-blowing text in the Bible. Isn't it? Yes. Hallelujah. I'm so excited by this message. But if, if this is such an encouragement and a privilege, why such a drastic warning? Why? Because Jesus knows the nature of man. Jesus knows our tendencies. Jesus knows that we are lazy. Jesus knows we are proud. Jesus knows we are filled of, of ourselves, our flesh, that will hinder. So he's giving us a, sharp, a stark contrast. This is what I want for you. But here is to make you look at the other side, the worst that can happen. The best that can happen compared to the worst that can happen. Choose what you want. You want to be burned, or you want to bear fruit? That's, that's, the, that's the key of that text. Choose. Accept, ye abide. Do we abide? Because accept that, it's not, it's not going to, to work. How does it happen? Carelessness, prayerlessness, getting out of touch with the Lord, and you know one of the things that is really important, get out of, the ch of touch with the church. The, the, the union with the believers, the, the abide in my love. And if you look in 1 John, we, we'll talk about abiding in the love and loving the brothers. It goes together. You abide in the love of God, you love God, you love your brothers. It's the same, same flow, same sap, same result. And it's attached together. So the abiding in the fellowship is very important for, for you to, to, to be repaired sometimes, to be encouraged, to be loved, to, 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 to be helped, and to be warmed, to be accepted. If you, if you detach yourself, you will miss out on the sermon, the visions, the faith, the activities, what God is doing. You, you miss out on, on all of these things. And it will have a result. It will have a result. We become cold. The, 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 the need, the, the feeling of the need to be in the fellowship will dry up. You know, people who are not going to church anymore, they at some point in the past were going to church. They were church attenders. They were there in the prayer and the worship. But something progressively, they let it happen in their life and then or something became more important than going to church. And as time go back, through a carelessness, not being so um, watchful, then they just slipped away. Like many other, like this is one area of that, but neglect the word of God. This is exactly the same uh, thing. So that's why the word abide is so important. Remain continue, be steadfast, persevere. There is no other way. There is no other way than that. And then when you become prayerless and all of these things and uh, we become indifferent to the Word of God, become indifferent to the work of God. That is serious also. Some of you in this room have been given talents I've been given skills. I've been given experience among the old timers here. But you are not using it. You are not willing anymore. Something is slipping away. And attitudes. Jesus says, abide. Remain. 
continue so that my work will continue to flow in you. Otherwise, if you don't abide, the work will not continue. You will enter it. Flesh will rise up. It's either the life of Christ that will dominate or your flesh. Except you abide. That's the rule. That's the rule of life. Let me read to you something that I, I read during our fasting and prayer. It's from someone in this room or in this church that wrote an email to me. And I was very blessed because I think it described abiding. And it's not by some great writer of the past. It's by someone who is alive. Alive and alive in Christ. And this is what she wrote. So far, I feel the Lord's presence there with me. I have many requests, but I believe that asking Him for a deeper walk with Him is the priority prayer. I am thanking God each morning the minute I wake up, and by doing so, I realize more and more how He is even in the smallest things which happens during the day. So I can really see only God could have done this. Isn't that great? Someone in this church is having this kind of experience. I have many requests, but I believe that asking God for a deeper walk with God is more important than all of my other requests. Each morning, the minute I wake up, I thank the Lord. And by doing so, all the little things of this day, you can connect the Lord with these things even in the smallest things that happen. So I can really see only God could have done this. The more we are thankful, the more we can appreciate the goodness of Him. I love reading the Bible's chapters we are to read each day and reread them as I truly like to be what particularly David was with God. Not that I haven't read it many times over, but concentrating on it, I truly begin to see how important fasting with prayers are. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. Abiding. Loving Jesus. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. I must stop because it's time to stop. So we'll continue next time. Hallelujah.